Good evening, welcome to everybody. My name is Ezekiel Panitz, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Sao Paulo. Today's talk comes from a series of talks uh, hosted by Abralin Alvivo, Linguistics Online. The initiative of these talks is to, is to provide students and, and researchers free access to state-of-the-art discussions on the most diverse topics related to the study of human language. Today's speaker is Sonia Sedino. The title of today's talk, When Can Objects Go Missing? Thank you, Sonia, for your coll collaboration. And I'd like to remind everyone that you can post your questions to the chat. And after the talk, we will, we will run through as many questions as we can. The talk lasts for one hour, and we'll have 30 minutes for questions and answer. And without further ado, Sonia. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, I would like to thank Abraline for the invitation. And um, this, is a, uh, it's, this is an honor for me to be, possible, to, to, to be able to present my, my work here. And today I'm going to talk about null objects. So when can objects go missing? So let me start sharing the whole screen. Okay, so um, there seems to be a general consensus on the cross-linguistic possibilities of subjects as null objects, I mean as null pronomena, especially in Romance languages. In general, they take into account this, 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 um, this proposals take into account the relationship between the, the subject, the null subject with agreement or the relationship with an, of, of the null subject with discourse linking. So the so-called null subject parameter has been the topic of extensive literature, but although proposals vary um, very much, in some sense, there is some kind of homogeneity in the proposals for the synthetic representation of null subjects as little pro or as no arguments. But the same is not true for the synthetic representation of missing objects across languages. So the aim of this talk is to show that missing object constructions called null objects, object gaps in a single language as, as well as across languages is better understood as deriving via the application of different operations in different languages and they do not constitute a homogeneous phenomenon. They are not always pro, little pro or variable or ellipsis. So there is not one analysis that can account homogeneously to the synthetic status of missing objects across languages. A range of phenomena is possible according to the properties that each language has. And then I'm going to talk about Brazilian Portuguese, the unaphoric third person null object that has a set of unique properties that correlate with other facts of the language and leads to a specific analysis that may not necessarily extend to other languages. So the outline of the talk today is first, I'm going to talk about this non-homogeneity of missing object constructions. Then I'm going to talk about null objects in Brazilian Portuguese as, and the properties it has, and then we'll come to the conclusions. So um, let's first talk about the different types of missing objects, because there are several phenomena in the, lang in the languages and also in the literature that have been called null objects or missing objects, or object drop, or object gaps. But these constructions are not all the same, and their occurrences are very restricted to certain con contexts or certain constructions. So for example, we have context-sensitive or pragmatically controlled missing objects. Languages seem to allow missing objects that are identified in the situational context. This is common. For example, this has been proposed by Mary Cato in 1993. She, she says that this is, she, she called this an isopro because you can find the reference of this, what's missing in the, in the, in the, in the, in the linguistic environment. So you see, can, can see even in English, something like send by mail or in German or, Brazilian Portuguese, la viantes. So I'm, I'm have, I have rice in my hands. So I say, I tell some, someone, la viantes. So um, this, is, this is not unique to Brazilian Portuguese. This happens in other languages. Also, Masul in 2003 says that missing objects are possible in river plate Spanish. 
uh, and the reference of the, the snow objects can be recovered by the from the immediate context. And then he, he proposes that this the omission of these direct objects is grammaticalizing the choice of tense and aspect. For him, the construction is anchored, must be anchored in speech time. So these examples are from, from him. And so in River Plate Spanish, you could say something like 2A, mozo le pedi agua con gas, and then the, the person will, the, the waiter will respond, we will answer, bueno, ahora le cambiamos. Or, donde guardaste los archivos? Then you cannot say guardé en el cajón del escritorio because then you don't have the, 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 the situation is not anchored in speech time. Cummings and Brombeige in 2005 has also talked about the possibility for, for missing objects in Canadian French. So they, they devised a, a typology of these missing objects and they say that these missing objects could be delinked null objects. For example, as in, in three, you are also in the this discourse situation. Uh, tu veux ce livre? Oh, mais j'ai déjà lu. So, so we are talking about this specific book. Or null objects that can be recovered by dates is just like the one that I mentioned that was uh, observed by Cato in 1993. So one person gives the other the newspaper and says, tiens, li. So you have the newspaper in, in your hands or what they call cognate null objects where the antecedent is in the situation. So you are in a, in a bookstore or in a newsstand and you say, je vais acheter un magasin au kiosque, je lirai un attendant, which means that you are in the situation where, I mean, uh, objects of, of, of reading are possible. And also not, co not cognate null objects as the ones in, in six, pendant mon congé sabbatique, je, sou, je surtout l'intention de lire during my sabbatical leave. Moreover, I have the intention to read. So it's just spend my time reading. And in 2016, I also um, looked for missing objects in South American Spanish and, and saw that they the also permit the same kind of, of null objects or missing objects. Cognate null objects, for example, complements to a verb that has a lexically related, related object as in the example in seven. And if you are interested in knowing who reads blogs and who they are, you could make a little effort and investigate. So this investigate, this verb investigar, uh, here I assume that there is a light verb hacer to, to do followed by a complement investigation. So the conclusion is that the verb investigating this example does not necessarily have an anaphoric null object, but it's related to the, to the lexical root of the verb. And, but this has to be, should be studied more extensively. Also, there is the omission, omission of the propositional clitic law in Spanish, in South American Spanish, as in example eight. Uh, e se te interessa saber quiénes leen los blogs y quiénes son, podría ser hacer un pequeño esfuerzo e investigar. Here, this, this, this null missing object is, refers to, in, to a ser, se te interessa saber quiénes leen. So you, you could have a, a law here, clitic law here, propositional clitic law. And also null objects with bare plurals, indefinite null objects. This has been shown by Alamino and Schwente, but also by Campos, 1986. Something like in examples in nine. Queria comprar libros, pero no encontraba. So this is possible in Spanish and in South American Spanish. Also, there has been uh, studies about this phenomenon, topic drop, especially this um, paper by Esther Shakespeare and et al. Uh, they, they rely on Francis Farscarelli and Hinterhold's typology of topics. And they propose that missing objects in Hebrew and also in Russian should be analyzed in terms of information structure. It would be an instance of topic drop. So the, the example is from, from Hebrew. Uh, you, found, you found the keys? Yes, found. So here we could have either, either found them or just found. Um, but there is a difference in Hebrew about between shifting and familiar topics, according to Farascarelli and Hinterhuis typology, because missing objects are only possible 
with familiar topics in Hebrew. And in Hebrew, movement topicalization is only possible with shifting topics. So it's the opposite what happens with Italian. We are going to come back to this later. So if a familiar topic is present, the sentence is only possible with a pronoun referring back to the topic, either a pronoun in situ or a no pronoun, little pro, they propose that it's little pro, it, it, that would be the missing object, the topic drop. Now, uh, in the case of shifting topic in Hebrew, there, there would be movement. So the example is here. Then he brought milk and apples from the supermarket. You cannot say the, you cannot say the milk he put in the fridge. You have to say the milk he put in the fridge. You, don't, you cannot um, exclude the milk. You cannot say he put it in the fridge, right? So the first sentence, 11, introduces milk and then an apples. One of the members could be the topic, and it must be moved to the sentence initial position, as we see in 11a, and then it cannot be referred back with a pronoun, as we can see in the continuation 11b. So according to the author, shifting, the shifting topic is realized through movement and not through the left dislocation, as is the case in Italian, and we are going to see later, we are going to back to this later. Now, if for familiar topics in Hebrew, the, the movement is not possible. So in 12, we have the object milk already introduced in the first sentence, and it, this makes it a familiar topic. The continuation of the sentence, as in 12a, shows that movement of the topic to the sentence initial position is ungrammatical. However, you can use either a pronoun or a missing object in the continuation. So we see that this is a different behavior um, of a missing object. So as I said, Hebrew is different from Italian because in Italian, we need the clitic left dislocation structure and not moving for shifting topics. Movement, the movement is reserved for familiar topics. And we'll come back to this later when I talk about Brazilian Portuguese. Now there's, there's also what has been called recently context missing objects. Masson and, Masson and Robert in 1989, Ruda 2014, they say, they, they observe that certain missing objects are allowed in certain contexts containing directions. Um, in this context, uh, perception or psych verbs are not allowed. So in a recipe, for example, take three eggs, break into a ball, you have a missing object and it is possible in English. So we have these examples in 13a, b, and C. Also, arbitrary missing objects were proposed in the literature by Rizzi 1986. Uh, they, 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 the gap is understood as part of the lexical meaning of some verbs, and it's always plural, and they show arbitrary, arbitrary reference, like 14. Now, all of these objects that we have seen Brazilian Portuguese does have, right? But we are coming, we're going to come back to other types of missing objects in Brazilian Portuguese. Now, another phenomenon that, that may be, be confused with null no, no objects is the null no complement no anaphora, which occurs in English, Spanish, and Brazilian Portuguese. In no complement anaphora, the no constituent is licensed by the main, main verb, even, even in English, as in 21a, or Spanish, and as in 22b, 21b. Languages that don't have these stranding ellipses, languages that like Spanish that don't, doesn't have this stranding English, uh, this stranding ellipses, and not even English doesn't have this stranding ellipses. English has BP ellipses. So 21A, you can say this in English. I asked Bill to leave, but he refused. And then the same thing is possible in, in um, Spanish. Los pacientes del tercero tienen que ser llevados a la terapia intensiva, aunque la enfermera con más fuerza no pueda. So this, this no complement anaphora is seems to be lexically um, induced because um, just uh, with models or certain kinds of verbs, this is possible. So even though this is a case of missing complement, and it, this is very different from missing objects and VP ellipses because no complement anaphora is lexically determined and missing objects or VP ellipses are not. Now, 
Also, there has been different analysis for missing objects because certain languages have missing objects that show certain behavior that 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 may that may the researchers claim that they are variables and other researchers claim that they are little pro and no arguments and we are going to see this for for example in japanese um no objects allow strict strict and sloppy readings as we can see in 15a uh, 15b so in 15a we have taro loves his mother and in 50b um, 15b hana hates so the the meaning of this no object here means that Hana can hate her mother or Taro's mother. So this is possible in, in Japanese. And um, additionally, they cannot refer to the matrix subject. So uh, my mother said that my father proposed to her. This can only mean that, uh, that, that my mother said that if my father proposed to her, um, uh, to her, not to, to the to, to, to him, not to the to the mother. Now, this this missing objects gets this analysis of argument ellipsis, but it's not just missing objects because not only missing objects, but also no subjects have the same property of um, straight sloppy readings. So, in Japanese, nominal argument ellipses are proposed both for subjects, no subjects, and for objects as the result of an, an ellipsis, nominal ellipsis, because the language doesn't have the, the head doesn't have the determiner. So it's not really something which is specific for objects. There's also been the proposal of, of this trending and VP ellipsis. For example, Goldberg and Doron says that object gaps in Hebrew correspond to this trending ellipsis in which the lexical verb raises out of VP to some functional projection, P or aspect. And then there's the ellipses of the rest of the verbal projection. Um, London 2018 is against this, this analysis, but this is not exactly a no object or a missing object because um, if we look at European, Brazilian, and Portuguese, that does have PP ellipses or B standing ellipses, but also these languages have missing objects, we, we, which may be even the result of this construction, but it's also a, a different phenomenon. So missing objects different from PP ellipses or B standing ellipses in Portuguese, because in ellipses, the, the, there is, must be identity, there's an identity requirement of the licensing verbs and the whole VP is delighted. So if we have 17, look at 17, a menina não pôs o casaco no armário, ela colocou na gaveta. The only thing that is missing here is the object. So here we have a, a, a missing object, a null object, and, it, and the verbs are not the same, right? Dispose and colocar. But if you have a menina pôs o casaco no armário, Pedro também pôs, in this case, we would have uh, this trending ellipsis because the whole VP, o casaco no armário, uh, were elided. Um, and additionally, there's a difference between the synthetic stas, status of European Portuguese and Brazilian Portuguese null objects or missing objects that we are going to, to, to see later. Now, in the literature, there's also been some cases where answers in short to short, short answers, answers to yes, no questions. Um, in these languages, you can have a gap in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the position of the object. And this has been considered as null objects, for example, in Raposo or in Campos 1986. But as pointed out by Medicato in 2016, Short answers must receive an analysis which does not necessarily include missing objects because it depends on how short answers occur in the language. For example, in Brazilian Portuguese, uh, short answers, according to Cato, they consist of just an inflected verb. And then in this case, the verb is moved to a presentential position. And then we have uh, TP ellipsis, the remnant of this movement 
is elided. But then it's a case of TP ellipse. So you have in 19, o Pedro comprou, comprou o carro? The answer is comprou. But the structure is here. All the TP moves to the front and then the TP is elided. So really, we don't have only the object missing here. Now, now we come to anaphoric null objects because as we have seen up to now, object gaps or missing gaps may occur in different and sometimes considered non-null languages, for example, English or French or Spanish, and they have a different status in these languages, right? But there are some anaphoric null objects in what has been considered null object languages that have a different and a specific syntactic status. I mean, they have the syntactic status that will vary according to the analysis that we, we find in, in the literature. For example, they have been analyzed as variables bounded by a null operator, for example, in Raposo or in Campus. They have been considered as little pro with licensing and, and identification requirements proposed differently by the authors. They have been proposed as argument ellipses, for example, for Japanese or even Portuguese. And all also as little n, the, the, uh, this empty n here by Ruda 2020, 2021, or as the p ellipses as, as I have been proposing since 1994. So um, the first thing is that this, the first paper that uh, came up the, about null objects was one 1984. And he discussed the properties of null objects in Chinese and proposes that the empty category there is, is a variable bound to a null topic. And then the investigation on null objects uh, began um, considering other languages. And for example, European Portuguese, Italian, Spanish, Brazilian Portuguese, uh, Quechua and other languages. And the proposals differ with respect to the synthetic status of the null object, considering at the time the typology of empty categories discussed in, in GB. Uh, so null, null objects were analyzed either as variables or as little pro, because this was the type of, null, of empty categories that we had at the time. For Brazilian Portuguese, uh, Farrell 1990 shows that the null object cannot be a variable as has been, had been proposed for European Portuguese by Raposo because in Brazilian Portuguese, null objects may appear in islands. Um, so he proposed that the gap is a little pro intrinsically specific, specified for third person. I will show the sentence later. Cato shows that this proposal fails to explain why this special pro occurs only in object position, but not in subject position. Why is this specific special pro just for object positions? And other studies also propose non object as, as pro, for example, Galvez 1989, Cato 1993, Barra Ferreira 2000, Bianchi and Figueiredo. And the difference between this, these proposals. Uh, concerned the different, uh, how this little probe was licensed or how it was identified. But the, any proposal for a Brazilian Portuguese null object as little probe must deal with the fact that this empty category favors minus, anim, minus animate antecedents. This has been shown early in, in the late 70s by variationist studies, and it has been shown up to, to now that this is a uh, uh, main, one of the main properties of null objects in Brazilian Portuguese that the, their antecedent is preferably minus anima. So some synthetic analysis ignore this property or others propose that this little pro is, is differently built up in the, in, in the case of minus anima antecedents because then we have to account for it. But as, as, as has been known, is, is well known. I observed the diachronic development of the of anaphoric objects in Brazilian Portuguese. The diachronic development development of these elements that occur in object position, and it, it's clear that this property is really um, significant. That um, the animacy is relevant for for null objects in Brazilian Portuguese. 
So I propose that it's not a small pro because it doesn't look like it's a pro now. It, it looks more like a, a, a P ellipsis because some properties are can be um, related to ellipsis. Um, more recently, the literature on all objects has also considered other possible analysis. For example, by Boz in 2011, 2019, uh, assumes the ideas in Tomioka, according to which the set of properties that characterize the non-argument languages reduces to the fact that these languages also allow bare nouns. So since Brazilian Portuguese allow bare nouns, Barbosa proposes that null objects in this language could be the result of nominal ellipses containing all the terms. But this is um, this is back some explanation because we do have bare nouns, but we also have the terms. So, uh, additionally, Ruda in 2018 um, follows this this research on the composition of the noun phrase and proposes that that um, this empty and P, this empty argument, is um, an empty NP, uh, what Chomsky is called the, this representation here, an NP that is empty. And she represented this as a little NP with a little N um, that is, doesn't, doesn't uh, have any phonetic contact. And then in this case, this category would be merged in a null argument position. And then Landau in 2018 argues that Hebrew has these trending ellipses and all objects are the result of argument ellipses. Uh, but differently from Brazilian and Portuguese, all objects in Hebrew do not show animacy restrictions, arguably. So we conclude that although bringing very interesting points and correlations, the proposals presented in this section for the synthetic status of all objects cannot be cross-linguistically applied without further considerations. It's necessary to look at the language and correlate the phenomena with other facts of the language. So this is what I do and what I've been doing for a long time about uh, looking at the Brazilian Portuguese anaphoric null objects. So as we, we have seen before, Brazilian Portuguese has the missing objects seen for no 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 non-null object language, for example, isopro or cognate law or null objects. This is common also in Brazilian Portuguese. But Brazilian Portuguese also has a specific type of missing object, which seems to be a byproduct of certain operations and process that are possible in the language. And this set of properties is that what makes Brazilian Portuguese of null objects unique. So for the first property is of what I call known islandhood, because it's very well known that Brazilian and Portuguese non-lobbyists may occur in island. For example, the, the sentence in 22 two, that I made reference before. Eu deixei os bolinhos na geladeira porque a Maria vai comer mais tarde. So this seems not to be possible in some languages as European Portuguese or Chinese, for example. But in Brazilian Portuguese, it has been long being argued that it's possible, so it cannot, uh, null object here cannot be considered a variable. Besides this island non sensitivity in 22, Brazilian Portuguese has other properties that occur together, and this seems to be unique in the language. For example, animus restrictions that we have already, that I have already mentioned. So, in Brazilian Portuguese, a sentence as 23A is possible, Alia chutou o vestido depois de experimentar. But Alia chutou rapaz, o rapaz depois de beijar is strange out of the blue. Now, sentence 22, not 22, 23b is grammatical with a full pronoun in object position. I can say Alia chutou o rapaz depois de beijar ele, or eles. And this is not a common restriction in null object languages, animacy restrictions. Besides that, we have the strict and sloppy readings possibilities in, in, in the language. So when I have a sentence like, ontem o Ivo pôs o anel no cofre, mas Pedro guardou na gaveta, the reference of this null object here can be Pedro kept Ivo's ring, which is the strict reading, or Pedro kept his own ring, which is the sloppy ring. This is ambiguous. 
Also in a sentence like 26, o João devolveu o livro em bom estado e a Maria devolveu estragado. This may, may be the same book or we can have the same book or different books involved. And this is not easily found, this ambiguity is not easily found in European Portuguese, this one here. Now, if an overt pronoun is used, then the sloppy reading is out. Ontem o Ivo pôs o anel no cofre, mas Pedro guardou ele na gaveta. This can only be Pedro kept Ivo's ring. O, o Ivo devolveu o livro em bom estado e a Lia devolveu ele estragado. This can only mean one and the same book. And this is one of the reasons why I argued in 1994, why we cannot consider that the null object in Brazilian Portuguese is a little pro, because it cannot, it's not just a non-overt pronoun, because it, when, when you have the overt pronoun, it doesn't work like the null object. Also, I have talked about structure parallelism. Null objects are only possible in parallel structures. That is, if the antecedent has, has to be in a complement position as well. For example, you cannot say o governador disse que o deputado desrespeitou na festa. So the antecedent of the null object cannot be the subject of the matrix sentence. But if we embed this in a context where there is VP ellipsis or VP stranding ellipsis, then a null object or a VP ellipsis is possible. Lia disse ao governador que ninguém desrespeitou ele na festa, mas o governador disse que o, o deputado desrespeitou. So here, either we have a null object, because we don't have the they don't have anything else to tell us that it's not an null object, or, or ellipsis, because we have the same verbs here. So this is reminiscent of the condition on, on parallelism or identity condition that ensures the recoverability of silent material in ellipsis. Additionally, um, disjunctive readings are possible for null objects. Uh, this comes from the, an observation by Sakamoto, uh, who refers to an observation by Simons or Simons, according to whom English pronouns, which are anaphoric on disjunctive arguments, can only yield what she calls the E-type reading. If you want a disjunctive reading, you have to use the, the ellipsis, the ellipsis. So in English, John scolded either Mary or Nancy. When, it's, when you have the sentence, Bill scolded her too, Bill is called the one who John is called the two. This is the meaning, the it, 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 it disjunctive uh, it type reading. But if you, if you have ellipses, Bill is called either Mary or, no, I'm sorry. If you have Bill is called either Mary or Nancy, one of them, two, then you don't have the disjunctive reading for this her here. Um, but, but if you have VP ellipses, you have the disjunctive reading. John is called, is called either Mary or Nancy, and Bill did too. So Bill this is called either Mary or Nancy. So the disjunctive reading is possible in ellipses, but not when a pronoun is used. And all objects in Brazilian Portuguese um, uh, uh, behave exactly the same uh, as, if, as ellipses. So if I have something like Maria preparou ou bife ou peito de frango, Pedro comeu quando chegou. Here we can have both readings. Either he, he, he ate either one or he ate the one that, that uh, she prepared. So if I use a pronoun, then the disjunctive reading is lost, just like in English. Pedro comeu ele quando chegou. Then it has to be whatever she has prepared, either the beef or peito de frango. And to my lord, to my knowledge, no other language has no objects so with all these properties together né, that I have just described. So how do I, we account for this set of properties? Well, I've, I've been arguing that an aphoric third, the personal objects in Brazilian Portuguese are DP ellipses, inaudible DPs that have identical antecedents. This analysis is based on the fact that Brazilian Portuguese lost third person clinics. They were replaced by full pronouns, whose antecedent may be either animate or inanimate, or by a null object whose antecedent is inanimate. Now, null objects arose due to a diachronic process, which involve other processes in the language, for example, loss of the movement and the increasing of the occurrences of propositional ellipses, which in my analysis fed the loss of third-person inanimate clinics. 
So this is the, the figure that, that I, where I show that propositional ellipsis goes together with the rise of uh, minus, minus animate the P, the P ellipsis. And the plus animate doesn't follow the same, um, the same path. So now I just have usually I mean, in my proposal being associated with ellipses because of the availability, availability of a strict sloppy readings, because of the structural parallelism, and because of the disjunctive readings. Now, assuming that ellipses must be licensed by a functional head, that Brazilian Portuguese has lost verb movement to a high functional projection, just the verb just moves to a low functional projection, that the ellipse is licensed by V in an aspectual head, that's what has been proposed. I postulate that this proposal, this position where the verb moves to is inner aspect. As a consequence, both VP ellipses and VP ellipses can be licensed in the same position because uh, they are supplemented by the verb that has moved to this lower functional pro projection contrary to what happens uh, in European Portuguese. So in Brazilian Portuguese, if we have a sentence like, ela tem lido livro para as crianças e ele também, e ele tem também lido, here we have uh, the ellipsis, right? The, the, the um, verb moves here to this position, which is inner aspect. And here it can, when it's there, it can uh, license the ellipsis of the VP or the whole the whole thing the whole vp here not only the dp but the whole vp now if i have uh, just uh, the, the the object then it's licensed in the same way ela tem lido o livro para as crianças e ele tem também lido para as mães so here we have the same structure the verb moves to this position and here it can uh, license the ellipsis of the dp here and we don't have a VP ellipses, we just have the null object. Now, now assuming that null objects are ellipses, it cannot be the whole story because as I said before, their antecedents are preferably minus animate. Now, if they are ellip ellipses licensed by the lexical verb that moves towards the aspect of this inner aspect head, and unrestricted null objects are only possible when the antecedent is minus animate, the impossibility of restricted null objects has to be linked to the fact that the ellipse is not licensed. So the question is, why are animate objects not licensed under ellipses? So now we turn to what happens with animacy. What, what's animacy in syntax? It's, it's very much studied the fact that differential object marking, for example, in Spanish, for, for differential object marking, Animacy is relevant. So in Spanish, if you say, he visto tu padre, this is ungrammatical. You have to, to say, to have a, right? The marking here, he visto a tu padre. But if you have an inanimate um, complement object, then you cannot, you, you, you don't use a, you don't mark the object because it's inanimate. So Many recent studies have proposed that DOME is the result of DP movement to a position outside VP driven by case requirements. And different authors have assumed different positions with respect to, to, the, to, to, to the specific case that A is encoding, dative or accusative. But the common ground is that DOME object is in a higher position than the unmarked ob object. So in other words, there seems to be a con consensus that inanimate objects, DPs remain in situ while animate ones move out of DP. So a natural question is, can we say that animacy restrictions on all objects in Brazilian Portuguese are effects of DOM in the language? Indeed, there has been some, some observations uh, relating to that, some account relating to that, by uh, Schwenter and Silva and Schwenter 2006 in a functionalist, functionalist framework, they have claimed that null of the, this opposition null object through pronoun, this pattern is reminiscent of DOM in, in Brazilian Portuguese, just like it, is, it happens in Spanish. And um, Rodrigo Smodonhedo 2007 proposes that A is the spellout of dative case and has person features. 
And um, the VP is projected and only has number of features. The lack of person makes it unable to value case. Movement on animate, spec, uh, animate VPs to the specific specifier of little VP cannot check, check case because little V lacks person features. So it has to move up to the specifier of a functional projection, which, it, which he calls the ATVP, where case can be checked because of the presence of relevant number and person features. So a A is a case mark. And objects that are not DOM marked get accused case in the specifier of the BP because they crucially only have number features and do not have person features. And the number features have to be uh, checked outside. So I proposed in 2016 that uh, following Richard's 2008, that uh, the features plus or minus person are inherent to different nominals. The piece that are minus animate, they are the personless ones do not move out of VP because they are fine complete and they have to they value case in situ by the fine complete probe V as in Rodriguez Mondonieto. Bare nouns are always inherently third person and they lack definiteness uh, in, in Richard's proposal as well. So bare plurals are, are also personless. So this is the, the, the situation that we have. First and second person have this feature plus person. Third person plus animate also has a feature for person, but it's minus person. But third person minus animate and bare plurals, they are personless. They don't have any nor plus nor minus person. They don't have person features. So animus in syntax can be implemented as the result of movement of a DP containing a plus person or a minus person feature to the specifier of a functional category that I call F, responsible for valuing case. And the piece that are minus animate and non-specific, the, the ones that are personless, they do not move out of P and they, they are fine complete and they value case in, in situ. So animacy in syntax is really the result of the movement of a plus person or a minus person DP to a higher position. And in this way, uh, I, I could explain the behavior of Brazilian Portuguese null versus over objects because only null objects can be licensed by the verb in the inner aspect position. And so if you have a sentence like, o estudante levou o livro para a biblioteca depois que leu, which is uh, possible, but you, don't, you cannot have o estudante levou o menino para casa depois que o professor expulsou, because here the antecedent is anima. The possibility of this null object here comes from the fact that it's inanimate, it stays in situ, it doesn't, and here it can be licensed as ellipsis because the verb has moved to this inner aspect position. Now, if I have ele, then this is, um, this is okay. It's plus, minus person, it moves up to this position up, up, um, outside the, 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 the crucial position of where the verb has moved. And then in this case, you, you have the, the you don't have an, uh, um, an old object. So if the anaphoric animate, ob animate object has to be spelled as a full pronoun, for example, then it's possible. But if it's, if it's, it's, if it's plus animate, it moves out. So it, it cannot be no. Now, if the antecedent is a bare plural, and all objects are also possible because they are personless, as we have seen. So that's why you have this contrast that has been pointed out in the literature some a long time ago. You can say os tiras insultavam presos e depois prendiam, but not prendiam eles. Os tiras insultavam os presos e depois prendiam eles. E os tiras puxavam armas e depois escondiam ou né, escondiam elas. Is strange, but I don't think that's so much strange anymore. So this is the summary of this idea minus animate move out of VP, plus animate don't, sorry, minus animate do not, do not move out of VP, of VP, and plus animate do move because they have to check this person feature in this position that it's above. Now, do we have evidence for this analysis? I think so, because there is some residual DOM in Brazilian Portuguese, because usually you don't think the Brazilian Portuguese has differential object marking as in other languages. But if we look at coordinated structures as the one here in 43, 
we need we see that the presence of a ah, signals or signals plus animacy uh, so if i have eu vi o menino e o professor também uh, we have here uh, a gap in ellipses right eu vi o menino e o professor também viu o menino but if but if if i have eu vi o menino e ao professor também then I have a coordinated object. So if I remove ah, I don't have the, the object reading. I just have the subject. Both saw the, 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 the boy. Now, ah, is impossible with minus anima. I can say, eu vi o menino e o professor também. Good. But I cannot say, eu vi o livro e ao caderno também. So this is, this is a signal that, also, that, uh, that I is relevant for animacy in, in some sentences, some structures in Brazilian Portuguese. Also, we have this fact here that with quantifiers, uh, if you use a, ah, it, it must refer to animate. So if you have ele visitou todos, todos can be either plus or minus animate. But if you have ele visitou a, a todos, it can only refer to people. If you, if you say, ele visitou alguns homens, okay, or ele visitou a alguns homens, this is optional, but you cannot say, ele visitou a algumas escolas. Also, if you have a sentence like, Pedro ama Rita como uma mulher, okay, Pedro loves Rita as a woman does. You can also have, Pedro ama Rita como a uma mulher, so he loves Rita as he does a woman, right? Now, if you have a, a, an inanimate, Pedro destruiu Rita como um trator, it means Pedro destroyed Rita as a tractor or a bulldozer this, uh, destroys, thus, right? But if you put, ah, this is ungrammatical because it doesn't mean that he destroyed Rita as he destroyed a tractor. So this is, this is uh, ungrammatical. Okay, so I think this is, evidence that we can have this movement out of, of, of the DP for animates, and this doesn't happen with inanimates. Now, what happens when we look at this shifting topic or familiar topic uh, uh, in Brazilian Portuguese, the ones that I have mentioned before about uh, uh, Hebrew? Frascarelli and Hint Hinterhose uh, propose a hierarchy, a topic hierarchy, where um, each topic, each different topic has a different syntax and a different position in the hierarchy. So I focus on, on familiar topics and this contrast between familiar topics and shifting, shifting topics, just like um, Esther Shakespeare et al. did for uh, Hebrew and Russian, to see what is the case of Brazilian Portuguese null objects. Because um, because maybe that would have some uh, explanation. But Brazilian Portuguese doesn't have third person please. So we don't have clitic climb, uh, sorry, clitic left dislocation. And shifting topics occur with clitic left dislocation in, in Italian. So Brazilian Portuguese doesn't have third person please and does, doesn't, doesn't have clitic left dislocation. But the language behaves like Italian with respect to different types of topics and not like Hebrew. So sh top shifting topics require clitic left dislocation according to Pascarelli and Hinterhold. So what happens in Brazilian Portuguese? We don't have clitic left dislocation. What we do, we, we can use full pronouns, right? They, and they are always possible when I, we resume a shifting topic in Brazilian Portuguese. But no objects are not possible depending on animacy. So if I say something like, hoje eu trouxe as garotas na festa, ali eu, o Ivo sempre reclama quando eu levo ela na festa, this is strange with the null object. I have to have uh, the pronoun here because this is a shifting topic. Now, if I have an inanimate antecedent, hoje eu trouxe o material completo na escola. O tablet, a professora sempre reclama quando eu levo na escola. That's much, much better. Quando eu levo quando eu levo ele? Then the one here. And then here we have a shifting topic. So, and this is different from what happens with familiar topics, because with familiar topics, as we're going to see, you can have both animate and inanimate. 
So for, for Frascarelli and Hinterhold, shifting topics differently from familiar topics can only be merged in the C domain, and they are always resumed by a critic. But I had proposed that shifting topics in Brazilian Portuguese also are always merged directly in the specifier of shifting topic phrase, and there are no re reconstruction effects. And then you can use, use either a full pronoun or a null object in this position. So um, then we can explain why we can have uh, this difference here between uh, plus animat and minus animat. If I have something like a Leo Ivo sempre reclama quando eu levo ela na festa, here, um, ela, uh, a Lia is, is, um, is merged here and can only be resumed by a, a full pronoun, which is animate, and then moves out of the VP. So this is okay. But uh, it cannot be resumed by a null object because then the null object will be here. And in, in what will happen is this. I can only use, uh, uh, sorry, if it's an inanimate, if it's an inanimate, then the inanimate stays inside and then we'll have an, an ellipsis. And then I can have o iPad a professora sempre reclama quando eu levo ou quando eu levo ele na escola. Because then in this position, I can either elide or I have the pronoun. And it's different here because if it's animate, I have to move it up. And so the verb cannot license it. And that's why I cannot have the null object here in this sentence with the animate and the Now, Now, um, interesting, there are different effects when a full pronoun and not ellipsis is used with shifting topics. Strict and sloppy readings are only possible with ellipsis. Uh, so I can have o iPad, a Maria deixa em cima da mesa. Mas o Pedro guarda na gaveta. Okay, so here I have a strict and sloppy ambiguity. But um, if I have a pronoun, again, I can only have the strict reading. O iPad, a Maria deixa ele em cima da mesa, mas o Pedro guarda ele na gaveta. So here I can only have the strict reading. Now, these junctive readings are only possible with ellipses. And uh, the e type disjunctive reading is possible with full pronouns. Ou o iPad, ou o iPhone, a Maria deixa em cima da mesa, mas o Pedro guarda na gaveta. So it can be either, either one. But if I use a pronoun, it has to be the, whatever she leaves on the table, on top of the table, this is what she keeps in the, she keeps in the, in the drawer. Ou o iPad, ou, ou o iPhone, a Maria deixa ele em cima da mesa, é, mas o Pedro guarda ele na gaveta. Now, these effects might be the consequence of the different syntax of full pronouns in Brazilian Portuguese. And now this is what I've been investigating late, lately. Differently from what happens with other so-called weak or deficient object pronouns, such as it in paycheck sentences or propositional clitics in Portuguese or third person clitics in Catalan or Spanish and Slovenian and Serbian, they, this, this, uh, this, this, Clitics allow strict and sloppy readings, but full pronouns don't. So they have a different syntax. And so my proposal in the investigation is that these pronouns, full pronouns have more structure than clitics. So assuming Justy, for example, 2001, full pronouns in romance on the rent of morphological reanalysis from demonstratives. So they are DPs in the specifier of a big DP. So being that position uh, and differently from what happens with the per per personal critics is what uh, preclu precludes them from having strict and sloppy readings. So plus anima, no objects are restricted in Brazilian Portuguese as we have seen. But some works on you know, Brazilian Portuguese have shown that some plus anima, no objects occur in certain configurations, often, as the topic of a preceding discourse. For example, I, I show that some sentences uh, where I, I constructed uh, with familiar topics could have uh, plus animate null objects, but that in, in that case, they were not, um, they were not um, generated in situ. They were the result of movement uh, from, like a topicalization movement. Now, uh, 
Pascarelli and Hinterholz say that there is a systematic correlation between discourse roles and grammatical properties of topics, which is encoded in this hierarchy that they propose. So it would be, but they 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 show this in with subject, or not with subject, they show this comparing syntax and also the, um, phon the phonological expression of these different types of topics. So it would be interesting to look at Brazilian Portuguese and, and, and check if this also is the case. So, so as the conclusion, I have five minutes. There are several different phenomena that have been called null objects or missing objects or object gaps, but they are not the same. There's not one analysis for all the possibilities of missing objects in null and non null object languages. There, there's a range of phenomena according to the properties that the language has. For Brazilian Portuguese, I have proposed that, well, because they, we have lost third person pleadics, because we have a loss of verb movement, or verb movement now is to a lower pro projection, because we have residual differential object marking, because we have the appearance of third person full pronouns and object position, that's why we have null objects the way we do. So in summary, minus anima null objects in Brazil and Portuguese have their antecedent in a parallel structure in the same sentence and are licensed by an aspectual head as the P ellipses because we know that because they allow strict and sloppy readings and disjunctive readings, and they cannot be covert third-person pleadings, which may allow strict and sloppy readings in some languages because we don't have third-person pleadings anymore. So why, why would we have no third-person pleadings? Now, plus or minus anima null objects in Brazilian may occur, but then as familiar topics uh, in a position of family, familiar topic or, or in previous discourse. They are not variables, and this is crucial because they are not the result of just the movement to, of the object to, to a, a position in, to the left uh, linked to a an operator, but as proposed by Cato 2003, they are the result of remnant movement to this position because they may occur in islands. So this is what we have to, this is what has, what Cato has analyzed and like the result of rem, rem, remnant movement, topicalization as the result of remnant movement. Now, plus or minus anima, uh, full overt pronouns may occur in object position, but they do not allow strict and sloppy readings because probably they have a big, bigger structure than clicks and some other properties. And there is, but there is a difference between plus animate and minus animate full pronouns that I've been also um, looking at. Because minus animate look, seems like they stay in situ and cannot be focalized as opposed to plus animate full pronouns. Then they, they look, it looks like they move out of a PP to a low focus position. That's why they can be focalized uh, as opposed to minus animate full pronouns. So the observation of these correlating facts of the language led me to propose that null objects have the synthetic status of the P ellipses in Brazilian and Portuguese. And by presenting this, this discussion, uh, I just, um, this talk came to, to contribute to this ongoing debate about the different analyses that are possible for missing objects. We have just had a, um, a conference on all objects, uh, online conference, which took place in, in, in Porto in Porto in, Porto, in, in Braga, by, uh, organized by Pilar Barbosa, which shows that the debate is ongoing. And this talk is um, aims at a contribution to this, um, to these studies. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. <clears throat> that was very interesting, um, very enjoyable. We have a few questions. The first question is from Janaina Carvalho. Mm -hmm. And her question is, regarding the analysis that no objects are only possible if their antecedents are not endowed with a semantic gender feature, which is the analysis of Kreos and Menuzi, do you believe that this analysis makes the same predictions as the one that no objects have minus animate antecedents? Uh, no, actually, no. I don't think that they have the same. Actually, I'm not sure whether the, the whether gender is uh, because we have to consider gender as animacy. Then, right? 
And I'm not sure how we could, um, if this is, if this is uh, really possible. Uh, in their analysis, they show some results, but uh, I'm not sure whether we can generalize, generalize this to all kinds of, of um, animates or inanimates. So, no, I, I'm, I'm not sure. This is the question, the answer to this question. I have talked to them already about this, about this but anyway, it's yeah. interesting. So we have another question. Um, we have a question from Renato Lacerda. Mm -hmm. He says, there is evidence that both animate and inanimate full DPs can overtly move out of little VP. And then he asks, why is the plus animate distinction that you propose restricted to no elements? So as an example, he gives an example of, of moving, um, moving the DP out of the little VP. O João não explicou uma história direito para Maria versus o João não explicou direito uma história para Maria. So he assumes that direito marks the left edge of little VP. And he shows that the direct object can occur to the left of the adverb. Well, I, I would guess that in that case, when we have different orders, it would be something later that occurs, uh, probably driven by you know information structure um, requirements. But um, at first sight, I I wouldn't. I would, I would allow plus animate uh, to move and plus minus animate not to move. And then later, some other rearrangement of the sentence could be the result of information structure. I don't know whether I answered the question. Yeah. By the way, thank you, Renat, for your um, reference of uh, Sakamoto. You were the, one, the first one that told me about that paper, which so was very interesting. As a follow-up to Renato's question, in your examples where you put the, the pronoun Eli to the left of the verb, um, the verb which is in the inner aspect, you're assuming that's covert movement? I'm assuming that's overt movement, but I'm also assuming that the verb moves out of, of the inner aspect to outer aspect. I haven't said anything about that here. So that's why I have the, the order of verb and then the object. I mean, from the, mm. so inner aspect is one first step of the, the verb movement and that that because I also assume I didn't say he, this here but I also assume that you have phases right so phases I'm assuming carney for example aspect internal and this internal aspect would be one phase and then the outer aspect would be another phase according to the to the to the um, situation where you have a, a predicate and then you have a, some kind of a, a temporal um, marker, and then this would constitute a, fa constitute a phase. So in the when, when the verb is in the inner aspect, then it can license or not license the, the verb. And then this is a phase and then it moves out and then you have another situation. And then this is the whole story. And, and the finite verb is in the outer aspect? It would be in outer aspect in the Brazilian Portuguese because, so, because of the studies that we have been going on about loss of verb movement. So if you have an auxiliary, vai explicar, vai expulsar, the auxiliary yeah. is an outer aspect. Well, then it's another then, question. So, but go ahead. So go then ahead. it would seem that your analysis would predict that the pronoun would be to the left of the main verb, which is actually ungrammatical. Vai explicar ele? Vai ele explicar with ele the object. Because ele moves to the left of the Yes, yes, part. yes. But I assume that the, the lexical verb is the one that moves. The auxiliary is a different thing, I think. You have to, this is, it, it, it relates on how we, we think the complex auxiliary and main verb works, right? So I could, can I, I could assume that the auxiliary is, is higher than the, the, the main verb and because of tense or something like that. But, uh, but the, the main verb is the one that moves. Okay, so, so movement of the main verb, the outer- Goes together. Is independent of it being finite. 
Yes. Because it's you have the fine you have the finiteness yes. marking on the auxiliary. Yeah, yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, they would go together as my guess. I mean, as a complex. Although they Vi can be separate. Visempreaks yes. because they don't have to yes, yes, occur as yes. a unit. Yes, that's that's true. Something to think about. Yes, well, this 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 is um this is a complication, of course, because you, you, I mean, how do we explain all the facts of Brazilian particles where, where you have the, the clitic, for example, occurring between the auxiliary and the main verb. But yes, there's something room for explanation. So actually, so on that subject before we have, we have a third question, but let me insert one of my questions first. So it's, it's, pretty typical within the ellipsis literature to say that that the licensing that that ellipsis licensing is, involves a very local relationship so for example um, t licenses vp ellipsis t licenses ellipsis of its sister or in sluicing c licenses ellipsis of the tp sister and that sort of uh, local relationship has been analyzed in terms of merchants e feature so I'm, I'm wondering, have you thought about how how your your model of licensing fits in with with the more general trend of ellipsis licensing? Because it seems to me that what you're what you're positing is is licensing at a distance. So you have the the null object, the the lighted object, which is in its base generated position as a complement to to the verb. And it's being licensed by the aspect head or by the verb which is raised to the aspect head. And they're not right next to each other. There's some distance between no. the two of them. I'm assuming C command, you know, like uh, the first uh, literature on, on licensing of ellipses, where ellipses has to be licensed by some lexical category in a functional category. So you have these with uh, VP ellipses or with um, nominal ellipses. Um, even um, even um, uh, I think sluicing or gapping or sluicing, where you have a, a lexical element in a verb predicate in a functional projection. So I don't don't think the, well, it has to that, be but, sisters. With, there has to be a sisterhood relationship, but a command relationship is important. Okay. So and and to clarify, it's it's C command by by inner aspect or it's specifically C command by inner aspect, which has been with lexicalized the by the verb. Yes, that's it. Okay. The verb has to move to this functional projection and from there it C commands the complement and, and then you have the, the lesion or the light, the lesion, okay. ellipsis. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we have a, th a third question from Sitlali Sanchez. So the question has to do with verbal replies. Você comprou o jornal? Comprei. And the, the question is, the, the, the question is, is it possible that this sort of construction was the first construction to illustrate null objects, to involve null objects in Brazilian Portuguese? Hmm. I never thought about that, but I'm not sure that would be the case. And if it were, <clears throat> we would have to, to investigate why, because in European Portuguese, you also have the same kind of answer, right? And also in other languages like um, uh, Finnish, other languages have just the verbal, um, the verb to, in a short answer, present in a short answer, and these languages don't have null no objects. So, but... But I and and I don't consider there is a null object in this in, in these instances. I think like Mary that you have movement of the whole VP. But but well, something to think about. I never exclude any possibility because nothing is ever finished in this subject. Okay, so I have a question now. Mm -hmm. about the verb identity requirement in, in verb stranding, verb phrase ellipsis. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that um, 
the lexical verb raises out of the elided verb phrase. And the copy, the trace of that verb is not identical to the trace of the verb in the antecedent clause. So it could be por and colocar. Cuando Ana poi sus oculus na mesa, a Maria colocó. So the trace, the traces of the two verbs are just, or the copies are distinct. Hence, the verb phrases are distinct, and the parallelism requirement on ellipsis is not satisfied. So my question is that um, that sort of restriction does not seem to apply when the thing that's moving out of the ellipsis site is a phrase. So for example, for verb uh, an XP, so for example, for verb phrase ellipsis, John seems to be a genius, and Mary does too. Where John is raised out of the Elida VP and then the antecedent VP, Mary is raised out of the Elida VP. Their copies are distinct, and yet it doesn't get in the way of parallelism. Same thing for a bar movement. Beans, I like. Uh, apples, I don't. So it seems that this sort of identity requirement on the copies of elements that have raised out of ellipsocytes seems to be, if it's correct that such, such a requirement exists, seems to be specific to head movement and not to phrasal movement. So have you thought about why that might be the case? I have never thought about why that may, might be the case. Ma Gabriela Matos was the one that first talked about this and proposed that this is a requirement, but that's a good question. Why is this a good requirement? And um, yes, mm -hmm. yes, no, I've never thought about yeah. this, but this is a good question. Mm -hmm. So one, one, one approach to take would be to follow what Idan Landau says, and says um, apparent cases of verb stranding, verb phrase ellipsis um, are actually not verb stranding, verb phrase ellipsis. So that just you know throws out the whole it eliminates the question to start off with. Um, perhaps it's relevant that in the cases I mentioned of, of phrasal movement, the, the element that's extracting is contrastive. So, you know, True. John mm -hmm. is a genius, mm -hmm. uh, Bill is not, whereas poor mm -hmm. versus colocar, they're not contrastive, they're just synonymous. Um, True. Mm -hmm. And actually, you do have some people like, uh, Gibanova, who's worked on verb stranding, verb phrase ellipsis in Russian, who says that um, the verb identity requirement can be can be successfully violated when the two verbs are contrastive. Huh. Yes. So, and so, it's, so then you could still hold on to the verb identity requirement, but it has to be has to be reformulated to allow for mm -hmm. either identity or contrast. Yes. Maybe that works, maybe it doesn't, but it's it's one route that you could take. Yes, that's true. Because contrast or same saying has to be present anyway in ellipsis, right? Because you have to either contrast or same saying. So something has to be going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I think we have more time. No, no one else has proposed any questions. So a question about going back to the beginning of the talk on exo on Kato's exopro. Mm -hmm. So this, so the no object that takes a an antecedent not from the linguistic environment but from the from the situation. So mm -hmm. it, it is true that English allows this sort of null object occasionally, if you know, send by mail. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that 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 Situation, situational no objects are allowed much more freely in, in Brazilian Portuguese than in English. Hmm. Um, is, that's my sense going, so for example, um, in Portuguese, I think one of your examples, if someone, um, if I hand you a, a plate of, of, of rice, you could say, da para Maria, mm -hmm. give, give no object to Maria. Um, but it, that's not good in English. Give to Maria. You have to say, give it to Maria. Or um, you know, other examples. Mm -hmm. But uh, I. Yeah. So if, if it is one and the same phenomenon, what accounts for the fact that it's more general 
more generally allowed in Portuguese than in a language like English? I think it, well, first it has this thing about being a direction, right? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, like recipes are thinking are included in this, in this um, category, let's say. So maybe there's something that is more related to, to this. How, do you, how would you call this, this um, genre, not genre, genre, but, but context where you have a direction. And then that would be more restricted than in, in, in Brazilian Portuguese, of course, because in Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese, would, we would have da para Maria, but then we would have a null object, uh, the, the common null object that we have here and not, not the one, it's not an instruction, it's not something that is related to the esopro that Mary talked about, which are instructions, for example, sent by mail, uh, recipe context, uh, null objects, and those, that kind of environment, uh, that kind of context is somehow prone to, to, to omission of objects in, in many languages. But in Brazilian Portuguese, besides that, we also have the common all objects. So in cases where you wouldn't have this context, you would have the, the common all object that we have. That would be the DP ellipsis? Yeah, yeah, probably. But then for DP ellipsis, are you assuming that's, that's a case of surface anaphora or deep anaphora? <sighs> because if you're saying that it's, you can do DP ellipsis in a case where you just have a situational antecedent, mm -hmm. not a linguistic antecedent, then it's an instance of deep Yeah, anaphora. but remember that I also talked about topics, discursive topics and... So, so maybe it's topic drop. Yeah, maybe it's kind of topic drop because topic drop, I mean, also there's, there's, there's something. What is topic drop? Because in German you have topic drop, but it's, it, is, it isn't the same thing, right? Because topic drop is, can happen when you have, um, uh, because it has um, subject topic drop, for example, right? So uh, I, 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 don't, I don't know whether I like this term topic drop. I think it's missing object uh, driven by, uh, by, by discourse relations. And then it's not, because then topic drop, you have familiar topic, contrasted topic, uh, shifting topic, all these kinds of topics that um, have been proposed. So yeah, so it would be an instance of this kind of thing, this discourse topic, familiar topic um, thing that I, I don't know how to analyze yet. Because <laughs> this, is, this is what maybe because this is a question, because it, if it's a topic drop, right? If it's, uh, say, a top familiar topic, uh, the, the consequence of a familiar topic drop. OK, when you have the, the movement or the remnant movement of the topic, this is clear. But when you don't have it, which is, this is just the topic of, that you are talking about, and then you, you resume it with, a, with an all object, then when, what do you have? You have a, um, what topicalization of a no topic. And is this the no topic of European Portuguese? No, it cannot be because it, it can't, may occur in Ireland. So I would have to propose that there is this movement of a no topic, a familiar topic, like the remnant movement proposed by Kat. And this is, you know, um, this is related to what has, what has been going on in the conversation, the topic of the conversation. But it's a long, a long story to, to justify or to give uh, arguments. I have to look for other arguments for that. So as to see whether you can, whether they can occur internal to islands. Yeah, actually, I mean, they, they can occur in islands, right? But with, this... without a linguistic antecedent, when it's just a discourse antecedent. I, I think they can. I mean, I think they can. But this is also something that, that's why I said that maybe something like Frascarelli and Hinterhoff did for Italian and German should be done 
for Brazilian Portuguese, where they compare different kinds of topics with the, also the, um, um, the contour, the, the, the speech contour. Uh, and they clearly made a distinction of different kinds of topics and different kinds of contours, and they came to these conclusions. So I would love to see that done in Brazilian Portuguese to see if this works as I'm thinking it does. So maybe this is an idea for some student that is watching this. Hmm. Oh, so Janaina has a, another question. Mm -hmm. okay. A question related to the first part of the talk. Implicit indirect objects do not seem to have so many possible analyses don't seem to have as many analyses as implicit null direct objects. Is there a way to account for the differences between the plethora of null direct objects and the relative uniformity of indirect objects? That's a good question, because uh, as Janaina says, uh, there are no many, not many studies about in, null indirect objects, and, and they may be, they are possible in, in, in even in English, I, 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 I think, because uh, did, you, did you give the roses to Mary? No, uh, yes, no, I gave the flowers, for example. Um, it's possible. And, uh, but what is this, right? So I don't know, even about implicit no objects, I think she's talking something like uh, the verb uh, falar, né? for example, falei. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what example. Um, indirect objects. We can only think about dar. Coloquei no armário. Coloquei. Doar. Doar. Donate. Eu doei as roupas, for example. Yes, eu doei as livros. Yes, good. Uh -huh. A good question, Janaid. I, I don't know the answer. I don't know of any uh, explanations for those, analysis for those. So, yeah. Thanks. I think we have no other questions have been posted. I'll monopolize the time and ask one further question, if that's okay. <laughs> sure. Uh, so, so you've shown... I think pretty conclusively that at least some instances of null objects in Brazilian Portuguese involve ellipsis. So they, they give rise to sloppy readings and that, that seems to be a pretty clear uh, bit of evidence in support of, of saying that there's ellipsis here. Um, but there are some, some examples in the literature that suggest that in addition to ellipsis, you probably also need little pro. So, for example, um, null objects can be used resumptively, which would, you know, just like pronouns can be used resumptively. Um, also, Marcelo Ferreira shows that null objects give rise to, they can be interpreted as an E-type pronoun. Um, and then uma criança que ganha um brinquedo novo vai querer emprestar eh, para os irmãos. No child that gets a new toy, will want to give it, the new toy, to his siblings. Um, and he also shows that the null object can, can give rise to donkey in Africa. So mm -hmm. um, having thought about how to, um, I guess the obvious solution would be to say that Brazilian Portuguese has two different ways of generating null objects. You have ellipsis and you also have little pro. Um, that seems to be a conclusion that you've resisted. Um, have you thought about how to how to bring those examples into the ellipsis fold, or at least to how to explain them away? Yeah, the problem with the little pro that I think is that it just happens in some instances and not everywhere, and then you have to be it has to be marked somewhere, right? Somehow. In this case, for example, and um, um, 
I remember when I was studying for my dissertation that I looked at these donkey pronouns and this itai pronouns in English is it, right? And it can refer to anything. It can be, I mean, can be this, but it can also refer to, it can refer back to, for example, the farmer who has a donkey beats it, right? The one, the famous sentence. But um, so it can refer back to 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 the, to, to to this donkey that is, and it's not bound. But I I thought that it was a good indication that our um, null object would be would 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 um, would uh, behave the same because we. We, we, we have to re refer back to an inanimate um, DP or an in inanimate antecedent. And, but, but we also have the, the absence of the propositional clitic, which would be also this it in English. So that's why I thought that the null object would be ellipses and not pro because the little pro wouldn't you you can wouldn't be able to explain why you would have it just in some instances and not the other ones so i'm not sure we should have this double analysis for null objects in brazilian portuguese but but then yes i have to because why can't because the problem would be if it is ellipses um, in, in the cases of the donkey and Afara or e type pronouns, you don't have the sloppy readings, right? You just have the then the stricter readings, the, the readings that refer back to because if you you have in some instances like the the man who o homem que deu o cheque para sua mulher foi mais esperto do que o que deu para sua amante. Then, in this case, you would have the sloppy reading, right? Yeah, but there you, you could say that o cheque has a, a, no, a no possessive pronoun. O cheque, né? Eu amo a mãe. O, o João ama a mãe. Or it's a mãe de, de. Yeah. So there, mm -hmm. it can just, there you don't need a pronoun. You can just do ellipses. Right, right. Yes. 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 A variable bound by the subject. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. But then it's um, ellipses anyway. I don't know. Actually, I have to think about those cases. But I wouldn't like this pro analysis for this because of what I just said. You, you cannot have. You would have to say no. In these cases, you have a small pro. And where this is a small pro come from, diachronically. One, I've, I've thought about the problem, mm -hmm. and it seems that it seems that the, the the wrong thing to say. So, some cases where where the the null object is interpreted as a pronoun, you can just have v. You can do ellipsis, and you have vehicle change. Which I think yeah. you, you even mentioned in your thesis, mm -hmm. but I don't think that solution is sufficiently general. So, for example, if you think of the Harris example, nenhuma criança que ganhar um brinquedo novo indefinite no Natal vai querer emprestar para os irmãos, but want to lend it. Mm -hmm. So, to analyze that as vehicle change, you'd have to have vehicle change from an indefinite to a antecedent definite. to mm -hmm. a definite mm -hmm. elliptical. Constituent. And I don't think you. I don't think we see that kind of vehicle change occurring elsewhere. Mm -hmm. True. Um, now you do have vehicle change from affirm affirmative to negative polarity. Um, John didn't buy anything. John didn't buy anything. Frank did. He bought something, and you can do the opposite. So, so where you have a shift from in polarity. I think you can appeal to something that looks like vehicle change. But, mm -hmm, but not here. That proposal yeah. in this master's thesis. Mm -hmm. But when you go from an indefinite antecedent to a definite, I think I think that's that's more problematic. Mm -hmm. 
True, but but uh, yes, but my problem, I think, in the, the worst problem, I think, is that be, um, yeah, well, yes, I see what you mean, but uh, but, uh, but I think the problem is, I mean, I could say no, you have an all object here because then you have ellipses, you have the parallel structure, you have the inanimate, yeah. everything is in place, but the thing is that it. it it's, as you said, you have an indefinite being. You're, you're not. You're not aligning an indefinite. Yeah. That gives yeah. the wrong reading. You yeah. need. You need. Mm -hmm. You need to be aligning. Probably you can do ubring kero novo, which would yeah. work. But then you're still yeah. going from an indefinite to a definite, or you're aligning a pronoun. Mm -hmm. But you're still then going from an indefinite to a definite. And if you're aligning a pronoun, then that's not even at all. Um, it's not at all identical to the antecedent. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. I see the problem. I'll think about it. I don't think we have any further questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Sonia. It's a great uh, talk. Thank very you. instructive. And thank you to everyone who, who participated. Thank you very much. And Good thank night. you for all the questions. They give food for thank thought. Thank you for the answers. And, yeah. And uh, as I said, this is an, 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 a not ending story. So, and it's good because, I mean, we, we are in business. Thank you. Bueno.